Okay. All right. Um, thanks for coming today. I hope uh, you've enjoyed the conference so far. I know I have. It's been a rich variety of talks, um, something for everybody. So um, I hope you'll uh, increase the diversity today with this talk, probably not what you expect. Um, my name is Phil Smith. I, um, I'm an amateur scientist. I do this stuff for a hobby. And uh, I use um, the Python framework uh, to, uh, to do the work. The um, thing I'm interested in is uh, recombination. Um, does anybody not know or everyone knows what recombination is? I have some idea. OK, I'll just go over it very simply. We have two chromosomes, which in your body you have two sets of genes, one from each parent. And when you make eggs or sperm, this process of recombination goes on. So we generate, basically, um, a sequence of DNA is produced that has taken bits of DNA from each of your parents. So it started on one. Oh, what have I done? OK. I think I've touched something. Maybe too scared to touch that now. Um, so it's basically going along from one chromosome, jumps over the other, takes some DNA from that, jumps back, takes some more DNA at some rate, which is called recombination rate. OK. This is, goes on inside um, your cells that are going to produce your eggs and sperm. OK. It's not working for some reason. OK, um, this is called, uh, the other thing that can happen is you've got f um, 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans. And when those chromosomes line up um, during meiosis, then they can independently go to either direction. So you end up a mixture of, each chromos um, of chromosomes in each daughter cell. So that's separate to recombination, but it's kind of the same thing. It's recombination with a rate of 50%. Okay. Should have checked this. It's not working. Oh, here we go. Um, oh, I haven't turned it on. That's why. Okay. So, just to bore you even more, how many of you guys did biology at school? Okay. So I used to hate this stuff. <laughs> I learned it time and time again and forgot it just as often. Um, but these are the stages that that the cells go through when they're producing gametes, which is either eggs or sperm. And the one we're mainly interested in is packeting up there. You'll forget this, but don't worry. This is this is the stage here. And so what's happening is the, the, the DNA starts to condense. The chromosomes that are homologous pairs line up, and they start to do this crossing over here, swapping DNA. And as they pull apart, you'll see these bridges form between the two chromosomes. This is also where independent segregation occurs. And you end up with two new genomes, right, which are different to the two parents because we've had this recombination occur. Okay, but they contain genes from each parent, but they're different combinations of those genes. Okay, so as you can see, this is quite a complicated dance. Presumably, it does something. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what does it do? Why is it doing it? Right, and that's part of what I'll be talking about today. Um, part of the problem with, so what we're talking about is, is sex, why is there sex? And the evolution of sex is an old problem in biology. It goes back quite a long time, but it was really kind of formulated in the 1970s. And one of the big problems is called the twofold cost of sex. <clears throat> Having two sexes is very wasteful. If we just had one sex and it would be reproduced asexually, you'd produce more offspring because if, if you have males and females, only the females can have offspring, right? Therefore, you, if you had only females, you'd produce twice as many offspring. So it, this is a cost of sex idea. It's quite expensive. What's it for? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you have recombinational load. So you might have a really great combination of good genes here, and you've got you know, one of your parents is just okay, one of your parents was really good, 
and we recombine them, and we don't get good, we get good and okay, right? So that has some kind of cost, okay? And we have the cost of courtship. It's really expensive. You can have things like all these kind of useless but pretty um, appendages that increase your chances of mating. So again, you know, you can sort of see from a biological point of view, we're going to an awful lot of trouble, <laughs> okay? Why? What's it for? And I won't go into all the theories about why this occurs, but just to say it's an ongoing argument, probably always will be. So yeah, sex is complicated and it's expensive. That's uh, kind of two things I want you to take home from that, if you didn't know that already. Um, it says a Python audience, they might not know. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, uh, so the next thing is, is um, a complete unrelated subject, and this is a Wolfram hierarchy of machines. Okay, so you probably hopefully feel a bit more at home with this. Um, who's, anyone heard of the game of life? Anyone not heard of the game of life? Feel free to Google it during the talk. Um, it's an amazing thing. I, I, anyone who looks at a game of life, I think, becomes intoxicated by it at some stage of their life. They just think, all they want to do is do this now. Um, he came up, John Conway came up with this in the 1970s, uh, late, late 60s, early 70s, and he was basically extending on the work of John von Neumann back in the 1940s, tried to make, tried to think, okay, if I have a machine that makes itself, what's the minimum amount of work I can do that in, right? How, how, what's the easiest way of doing it? Um, so he came up with these two-dimensional two set automata, um, which do all kinds of crazy things. And Stephen Wolfram, back in the 80s, came up and thought, that's too complicated. Let's just one dimension, right? So he said, let's just do a one-dimensional set of automata. And he came up with these, which um, are equally intriguing. And um, after looking at them, he thought, there's actually only four kinds. And to me, I think this is one of the most insightful things I know about, is that all machines are only four kinds of machines if that's true, right? And if you accept that, that's, a, that's an amazing statement, right? So the class one leads to a homogenous state. So they basically do nothing. Actually, I'll flick to the next side. Basically, the class two, uh, they go to limit cycle and just oscillate. Class three are chaotic, go to random, so basically random number generators. And class four have um, complex structures that persist for some time. Basically, some of them up like this. So class ones do nothing, class two oscillate, class three are random number generators, and class four. Class four machines can, in theory, simulate all the other machines. Okay? That's the big difference. I always used to get hung up and thought the class three, class four should have been around the other way, because it's like in between class two and class three. And I thought they were idiots for doing it that way, but actually they're right. <laughs> Surprisingly, these guys are smart, they got it right. Um, so, uh, yeah, class four can simulate all the other machines. Okay, everybody happy with that? Any questions? Okay. So, the Wolfram says the automata. This is example, this is, this is rule 110, which is one of the, probably the most interesting rule. Okay, and I'll just go through how it works. We have this, this top line up here, the first line, which are range from zero, 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 white, 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 to black, 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 and we have all the possible combinations. So there's only three bits. So there's two to two to the three possible rules. Okay, and so this rule, we says, if it's three whites, then we put a white down underneath on the first, first, line, uh, first block. Second rule, if the right-hand side is black, then we make it white, and so on, up to uh, three black dots. And we can, the, the, the rules are enumerated this way, so it's two to the one equals two, two to the two is four, and we just sum that up, and that gives us a number, and that's a rule. And there's 256 rules, okay? So we have a, a complete set of rules of all the possible set of automata that we can have with just those three bits, okay? So, any problems with that? All right. um, so there's 256 rules. And some rules are left-right homologs of each other. So going back, there's rule 136. I think it's 136, where that just goes the other way. Okay? 
So this is biased that way. 136 is biased the other way. Um, so there's lots of different. Look at rule zero, for example, at the top here. It does nothing. Because rule zero, everything is zero. Okay? Nothing works. Okay? Rule 256, everything is black. Everything works. So those are class one machines. Okay? They don't do anything at all, really. And so this is a thing called the Wolfram Atlas. You can go online and you can have a look at the properties of all the different rules. Here we go for time. Oh, I should have started. Here we go for time. Okay. Um, this is rule 110. So what they've done here is they've started with a random number at the top and it wraps around. So the last bit on this side calculates its state from one bit on the other side over here and vice versa. So it's, it's a wrap. You can see the gliders will go off one side and not the other. And what you can see is um, that the gliders have a bias in one direction, but where gl the gliders collide, you can get new gliders forming. Okay, so these are persistent structures going down here. They're gliding down through time and through space, and they're interfering with other gliders, sometimes catastrophically. And you can also see this repeating pattern here, where it's just um, uh, like a, a mat. That's sometimes called the ether. Okay, so that's what things propagate through. So these gliders can't propagate unless there's an ether for them to propagate through. So that's an important thing that we'll cover later on. Um, rule 30 is a pseudo-random number generator. Okay. So you put in a random or any input here, and it basically just makes a pattern like this. And the thing that you can pull out here is there are kind of glider-like structures, but they don't persist for very long. Okay, they're quite fragile. They hit another glider and they disintegrate. Okay. And rule 30 is a glider at, at 30 bits and above, or 27 bits and above. If you go below that bit rate, it stops being a random number generator. So that's, there are phase changes from one type to another in some cases. Okay. So... I wanted to play with these, and what I wanted to do was um, basically generate genomes. I want to have a genome or a bit string, and I can say, is this viable or non-viable? And so what I did is I got this Wolfram system, and I didn't wrap around, so it just, it just truncates. Okay, so eventually it goes down to one bit. And that is my sort of indicator bit. It'll tell me whether the string is viable or not. So I get a bit string of, it has to be an odd number. I apply my rule to it, and I keep applying it until I get one bit. And if that bit is a one, then it's viable. If it's a zero, it's not. And so I can do it to an arbitrary bit string, as long as it's an odd number, and I can apply an arbitrary rule. And I can mutate it. Right? So I've taken this right-hand bit and I've flipped it to a white bit, or zero, and see if it affects it, and it doesn't propagate down, right, because it's going zero, zero, zero to zero, one, zero, zero, that's zero, two, one, zero, uh, zero, one, zero, that's one, so it hasn't changed it. So that's what we call a neutral mutation. It has no effect. All right, or I could switch this bit here, make that a one, and this propagates down and sets the indicator bit to zero. And so that's a lethal mutation. It's just killed it. Okay? So now I can make, I can have an arbitrary rule and an arbitrary genome, and I can see if it's alive or dead. And so I can do, for, for small bits, five and bits of nine, I can do all the genomes and all the rules. And I can have a look at whether they're viable or not. And you can see, for example, rule 256 goes out in the edge, everything dies. Rule zero, everything lives. Uh, in the middle, it gets more interesting. Okay? And what I can do is I can connect all the viable need genomes to their one-bit neighbors, so one having distance neighbors. So that's, if two strings are, are viable and they differ by one bit, then I connect them up. 
and I can make a pretty little network like this. And you can see different rules have different networks. Some of them are very simple, just regular graphs like these. Some are regular graphs of different size. Some have these dense regions joined up together somehow. Uh, you can't reach that one. That's different size ones. Down to rule 26, which has this kind of really weird graph straight shape. Unfortunately, once you get to interesting bit lengths, it's, you can't, it's not practical to draw it. So now I've got my network, I've got my, my nodes, and I can mutate them. Okay, so if a, if a should have nine neighbors. Um, if, an, if a genome has like a bit string of nine, it's got nine possible neighbors, I can flip nine bits. How many of those are viable, right? So it might be, say, 37% of them are viable, or 12% of sorry, sorry, five out of eight might be viable, or seven out of eight are viable. That's, that's the load, okay? So if I randomly choose a bit and flick it, how many times does it kill it, okay? That's what we call mutational load, okay? So if you have lots of neighbors, you have low load. If all my neighbors are viable, then every mutation survives, all right? So I'll talk about density and load. Basically, load is one minus density, okay? The more dense part of, the, of that network, the more neighbors you have. So it's quite an important thing. And I can do recombination. I can take two genomes, swap the bits, choose one of the offspring, and say, is it viable or not? And I can say how often it dies. Okay. So here, we have response. So this is, this is asexual reproduction up on the left, up here with the white, white circles. Dark circles is sexual reproduction and back. So this is generations along here, so I can switch sex on and off with different recombination rates. And this is rule 30, right, with recombination. It's a random number generator. Recombination does nothing, okay? Just randomizes it some more. Whereas rule 110, initially the population moves into the dense, starts to move towards the dense regions of the network where there's less load. Okay, so the population moves in there, down here, starts to move down. I introduce recombination, all hell breaks loose because I've smashed up all those combinations of genes. But I'm selecting those individuals that have the lowest recombinational load. Right, they're surviving more, and it drops down to some equilibrium point. And then if I turn recombination off, I've got less mutational load. This has gone into a denser region of genome space than then I get my mutation alone, okay? So I can kind of tell the difference between these two types of machines, a class three machine and a class four machine. Okay, class four machines respond, well, appear to respond to recombination. Now, you might just say, okay, just check all the class four machines. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are because it's undecidable whether something's class three or class four except by looking at it and thinking it looks like one. So I have no way of knowing if I'm doing this better than anything else because nothing else does it. But it looks good, so we'll stick with that, <laughs> okay. All right, so yeah, any problems with that? Any questions with that bit? Okay, okay. so how's that working? Well, recombination seems to be selecting for gliders, so we take this uh, rule 61, which is quite a nice little rule. We do this stuff, and what we do is we get all those little diagrams I drew before with the little triangles for every one in the population and we superimpose them on top of each other and take a heat map of that, okay? So that's what this down here is. It's a heat map of the population at that time. Everybody get that, all right? And that shows us which pixels are popping out, right? Which pixels everybody has. So this is saying if it's black, everybody has that pixels black. If it's white, everybody has that pixels white. If it's gray, it's pretty much random. And so we generate with a random, start with a random starting population, and it's pretty much gray, okay? We run asexually, and we get a bit of pattern emerge. When we do recombination, recombination brings that pattern out. We're making them more similar. They're going into that well in geom space, and we're getting um, uh, selection for this dense connected region, okay? We take it off and it expands back out and we get back this pattern, which is 
the same as what we start at, uh, same as we had at the end of the uh, asexual run. So how is it discriminating? Well, what it's doing is, it's because it can make gliders, we don't need so much of the genome. We just have that little part that makes the glider. That's going to slide down and, and hit the indicator bit. So the rest of the genome is pretty much neutral. right? And because we've got these small gliders, we can have redundancy. We can send two gliders down. And as long as they can sort out the conflict here, that's fine. So we can have redundant systems. right? The other thing is, any bits that may interfere outside of that, they can be kicked off by another glider. We could have a glider that just blocks them. Right? So these gliders allow us to make things really robust. Okay. Now, if this is working, and I'm having trouble with this part, so if it doesn't make a lot of sense or it doesn't look really good, it's because it's not that good. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's still trying to make it... It's hard to prove it, right? But trying to make something that's convincing. We should be able to ca calculate recombinational load for both class three and class four machines, and we should have an equation that works one for one, well, for one, but not for the other, all right? We've only got really three variables we can play with. We've got the Hamming distance, that's the distance between two parents, right? We've got recombination rate, so how often we're jumping between chromosomes as we generate the next chromosome and mutational load of each parent. So whereabouts in genome space each parent is. We can get these two quite accurately. Mutational load is quite hard to get. We can get, it doesn't tell us everything. It just tells us that point. And actually, it's the topology of that point that we really need to know. But it's not a bad approximation. So we can have a, a, a try and come up with a, an equation for recombinational load. So we have the whereabouts. So this is your load. You, we can have negative load. Um, may sound counterintuitive, but redundancy gives us negative load. Negative load means you have to have at least two mutations for it to be broken. Okay? So we can go down this way to basically the length of the genome. So we can have n minus whatever the length is. Or we, can, we can measure these two things. We can measure the Hamming distance. We can set the recombination rate, and we can play the game. And mutation will drive the population down into these wells, but we know it doesn't do it completely, but it does it reasonably well. Um, recombination, we grab two points from genome space. We recombine them. Okay, now we're doing recombination. We get a whole lot of offspring, and those offspring get scattered around the place. Right? But this load is one month's density. So the areas that have high load have low density. Okay? So the offspring of, that are closely related to a poorly connected parent are most likely to die. Right? So this will, this will preferentially kill um, offspring that land in the less dense regions. And that, that basically drags everything down into the well. Okay? Because if you're well connected, the, your recombinant offspring are, are likely to be close to you and are therefore more likely to survive. So we can come up, this is my second attempt at equation to explain this. Um, the Hamming distance is a relative Hamming distance, so it's how many distances divided by the genome length. The, the loads are two parents, um, so it's a negative power. And this doesn't, oh, so this shouldn't work for the class three machines. Class three machines are on this jagged surface. They can fall down a little bit, but when they have recombination, it just throws them back out onto top again, okay, because that, that seems to be how they work. So let's try that. We've got rule 22, which is a, um, appears to be a class three machine. It seems that it will, under mutation load, improve a little bit, but you can have recombination as long as you like and nothing happens, okay. So this is with our calculated load here. Um, this kind of gets the, the figures in the right ballpark. Not quite, though. Doesn't seem to be any real pattern. Uh, we can compare that with the pop. So that's, oh, sorry. That's the population. We take this population this time, calculate the, the theoretical load and what we actually measure, and try and see if they match up. And they don't match up very well. Here we do it for, now this is moved down here. So this actually is. They're deeper into the well, 
but it's not really making any difference to the calculated load or to the recombinational load. Okay. Rule 110, we can try it. And what we get is we start with that same population here. We get some improvement. So this moves slightly to the left and the load moves slightly down. And then when we're at equilibrium, it drops down into this well. Okay. So down here, we're down in the well. And so we have an equation that in some ways can, it's not great, but it can discriminate between the two. Okay, so now that we can identify class three and class four machines by using recombination, we can use that to look at some more interesting problems. And one of those is arms race. Okay, so arms races are well established in, in biology and probably in a whole lot of other things. Um, if you take, you know, the original throwing a stone at somebody, and now we have tanks and armor and anti-tank weapons and the whole tank, anti-tank arms race that's still going on. Um, this is a common theme. And so what I wanted to do is play with this. So we could, we could have a, a host genome on the right-hand side here and a pathogen genome, and we can put them together, and the gliders can fight it out. And then if the host wins, it goes back into the host population. If the pathogen wins, it gets dumped back into the pathogen population. And we can just keep doing that, right? And we keep fixed population sizes. And we can write it out like this. We have um, 0 and 1 to the, to the, for the length of the host and 0 and 1 for the length of the pathogen. If the host wins, if it's a 1, the host wins. If it's 0, the pathogen wins. But the thing you want to understand about this is that when the, if the, with the pathogen 1, it's winning with a genome from the host that was previously winning in the, in the, in the previous generation. So it won before it's losing now. Okay, and, and the same for the pathogen, right? Oh, okay, so I'll play this again. Here we have the host on one side and the a pathogen on one side and the host on the other, and the gliders are fighting it out. And this is how well it's doing. So on the, the small graph, you'll see this is the pathogenic load, so how many of the hosts are dying, okay? And these are of equal genome length, or near enough. It's a one bit difference because it's an odd number. And so that's the host genome, and it's the pathogen genome. And you'll see these gliders are forming, but then there's a counter glider which wipes it out, and then a new glider forms, and it's just going in this kind of chaotic cyclic pattern. All right? So this is at equilibrium. It, it meanders up and down a bit, but no real pattern emerges. We can change the ratio of host to pathogen genome. And this, I actually thought was quite interesting because I don't think from a, from a disease point of view, no one's actually really considered genome length. But when you think about genome length, it's important because whoever can recruit the most genes into the fight is going to win, all right? So if you've got a very small genome, you've got very little genetic material to play with. If you've got a big genome, you can recruit more genes. So obviously, if you've got all the genome, you're going to, you're going to win. If you've got none of the genome, you're going to lose. Okay, and the equilibrium points around about 50%. Um, rule 110 forms gliders better one way than the other, so it's slightly to the right of that. So that's with uh, 75 bit genomes. Let's introduce recombination. The theory says recombination should help because we're going to have these new wonderful combinations of genes. They're going to win, 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 and they'll get sick of winning, and um, it'll just spread through the population. And that just does not happen, okay? Here we've got our pathogenicity along here, and we're introducing host six. Uh, sorry, yeah, host six, right? So the host is under doing recombination, and it's a disaster, all right? The load goes right back up to where it was when we began, and it drops down under asexual reproduction here. So then we try it in the pathogen, and the same thing happens, but it's the opposite sign. It's going the opposite direction, right? And the same thing happens. It goes back to equilibrium there, right? So in both cases, sex made it worse. So what's going on? Well, we can look at the length of the genome and say, OK, if your genome, if the pathogen genome is bigger, it's going to have more material it can draw on. So it's going to drag the equilibrium this way, and it's going to have a well somewhere in genome space that it can use. 
okay? But the population will be dragged the other way by the small pathogen, and so you'll get, it's basically going to be in the equilibrium point, which will mean for the pathogen, it's a random number generator. If the pathogen genome is small, if the host genome is big, it can kind of just deal with the host with part of its genome and use the rest for just making sure it hits the indicator bit. And vice versa for the pathogen, for the host, if the host genome is long, it can just isolate the pathogen and say, okay, you just stay over there and don't interfere with my genes and I'll just deal with the rest of my stuff. And so it can go into a well, but the pathogen genome is completely bound up in the fight. Okay, it can't, it can't, um, it has no redundancy left. There can't be any redundancy. Okay, because every gene has been recruited into the fight. So you kind of think of it as the octopus fight. Okay, if you've got two octopuses fighting, they recruit legs into the fight until all the legs are occupied, and there's an equilibrium state. If if one limb now gets better or worse, you're going to win or lose just by that, okay? Because once one leg's gone, then the other legs can then gang up until you, you, you've won the fight. So this is kind of like an octopus fight. The more legs you have, the, the more likely you are to win. We have time, okay. Right, so we can run this. One of the things I want to do, I'll just let this run through, and you'll see, you'll see something weird going on, and I'll explain why I did it, <laughs> okay? But this is running, it's a fight between two genomes of each equal length, host on the right, passage on the left. And you notice pathogenicity is slowly dropping, and it's all going along, and then suddenly, bam, that happens, right? And what we did here, what I did here, was I was actually trying to make sex work. I thought, okay, let's drop the mutation right, right down so that all the pathogen genomes are basically the same, and it can then adapt to that. And that didn't work at all. In fact, sex still didn't work. But what you get here is a highly structured defense, okay? These are all pretty much fixed. It creates a zone of death here. The pathogen cannot propagate over that, that ether. There's no ether for them to come over. So these, um, the, the pathogen genome is just bouncing off here and it just becomes randomized because nothing works. Right? And you get this solution. So if you want to watch, watch again, you watch this graph and that graph, I'll just repeat it for you. Okay? See what's happening with the, with the um, pathogenicity? It's gradually dropping until this highly structured structure, highly organized structure evolves. And it has to evolve slowly because, the, because it's such a big structure. If the mutation rate was high, it would keep breaking. Okay? So eventually it comes along and it just cleans up. Bam, it wins. Okay. Now, part of the reason why it doesn't happen on, oh, sorry, on, um, on the host side is because these gliders aren't, there's not that many gliders going that direction that rule 110 can select for, from. Okay. Okay. Any questions on that? Oh, bamboozle. Unconvinced. So, we can conclusion, right? The surface in these armor races is spiky, okay? It's not a smooth surface. It's a very jagged surface. So, if you have mutation, you're going to get thrown out of that, that spiky little well. You can't, you can't stay there. You can't survive there. You get thrown back onto the surface. Recombination is going to do the same thing. So recombination disrupts these multi-gene structures, right? Uh, mutation breaks them as well. So you have to have a very low change rate. Conclusion, you, can, you can't have sex on a spiky surface, okay? It just doesn't work. And class three machines are spiky surfaces. Class four machines have smooth surfaces. Um, I have to mention Python at least once. That was it. <laughs> Um, I used MPI for Pi uh, to run, run over several processes. Uh, took a bit to figure it out, but eventually it worked. Uh, Cython to try and speed things up, so just recompile some of the functions in Cython to the work. Matplotlib to draw things, and NumPy to talk with um, MPI and Jupyter Notebook to analyze the data. And just a few acknowledgments. 
Um, thanks to Alton Python, Python Group, who've uh, been really good. Um, my friend Lawrence Delivery, who is uh, Delivero, who's um, my uh, guy I ring up when I don't know what to do, and he really suggested to use Python for this stuff, and it was a great idea because um, there's just such a great tool chain for, for analyzing data and doing things. And there's so many people using it, basically everything you want to do, someone's already had that problem and it's got an answer. Um, some of my long-suffering science friends at University of Auckland and Massey, um, Buck, Kaisenov, uh, Kusinov, at Auckland, who was um, instrumental in getting us started when we had a few discussions. Uh, this is um, uh, Stuart Kaufman, who is, um, he wrote this book, Origin of Order. It's a really good book to read if you're interested in biology and complexity. Uh, he was one of the guys who set up the Santa Fe Institute. Um, and I had the, the pleasure of meeting him uh, early this year and having a, a chat with him. Uh, it's a great book. And it'll, um, it's quite old now, but still a really good book. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Um, that's a good question. Um, bigger, longer, more <laughs> uh, is one thing. There are possibly other phase transitions out there. Uh, we saw some in Rule 30. There could be phase transitions in some of the other rules. Um, and one of the things I want to look at is, is there anything I can use this practically for? Um, highly unlikely, but you never know. <laughs> yep. Any other questions? Yep. Um, in ecology or biology, some mutations can have favorable results yep. in terms of longevity and some negative. Yes. Uh, does this differentiate between those two potential pathways? Yeah. Um, this is based on basically looking at the role of recombination in longevity, right? So. There's a theory of aging called the reliability theory, which just basically says you have so much reliability and you consume it with time. Uh, different people have different amounts of reliability and eventually you're t you're, you run out of spare part or spare capacity. <clears throat> uh, I wrote a paper on this saying that recombination selects for reliability because of these, the glider formation and redundancy. So it selects for redundancy. Um, because basically what you're doing is you're, if we go, uh, way back, um, excuse me. Um, sorry, sorry to be a pain. Okay, the the thing that these are about, right, is you have um, these logical statements that say if things are true or false, right, and what. Everything in the real world is conditional. Okay, there's conditional truths or contextual truths. And so this might be true, but if we introduce some other change, it might change it to false at some distance. And so these, originally I designed them kind of like nested rule systems. So the truth of a statement depends on the truth of something else somewhere far away. Okay, and what this does, it tries to make, con recombination keeps changing the context of those truths. And so it selects for truths that are context robust, but not context universal truths. If you understand that. Okay. Any other questions? How would you apply the rules? I mean, are there so many rules you just mentioned? Yep. But which one to choose when? How do you know? You just look at all of them. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, originally what I did was, was generate all the rules and go through them. And, and, uh, and there's, I mean, there's, uh, there is information on the rules. So there's articles about rules, and there's an atlas of rules. And um, you play with them and, and see what happens. Uh, you don't have to look at all of them because some of them are identical. There are black-white equivalents and left-right equivalents. Um, and so you quickly narrow down the rules that are of interest. But you just, in the end, I wrote programs that just looked at all of them and just looked at the output. And, oh, that one looks interesting. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, would you mind going over one more time how there ends up being more than 64 possible rules? Because I see... Ah, uh, there's 200. Okay, sure. Uh, where is it? Um, okay, so you've got uh, three bits here, right? So there's two to the two to the eight possible. Oh, sorry, two to the two to the three possible blocks you can have. Okay, so you can have that could be zero 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 along there. So there's um, two to the eight possible rules you can have. Okay, but there's only I think there's about 140 actual actually unique rules that if you take all the black and white homologs and left right homologs because this this rule you can see it's biased one way. Um, that, that equivalent, so black, black, white, is not there. And if I had black, black, white was black, and then white, white, black, so um, white, white, black, black was white, then that would be the same rule, but going the other way. You understand? <laughs> so it's like symmetric. It's and symmetric, you yeah. You wouldn't double count it. Yeah, if you go on the atlas, go and look at the Wolfram ECA, Elemental Set Automata, um, Atlas and it has all the properties of the rules and their homologs or related rules, and uh, the logic. There's, there's logic you know, logical versions of this rather than just going that's a two, that's a three, right? But that's how I do it. I just go uh, that's one, <laughs> that's two, that's three. If I find a two or a three in those bits as I scan along, then it's viable. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.